Hello and welcome to our online service today, which will include communion when we remember the sacrifice which the Lord Jesus Christ made on our behalf on the cross at Calvary. I'm Charles, one of the deacons here at Grimsby Baptist Church, and it's good to have you with us, whether you're around the corner from the church building, in one of the local villages, or perhaps even on the other side of the world. And I pray that you'll be blessed and encouraged by our time together. Our speaker today is Jeremy Bass, one of our deacons, and he will be continuing our short series, What is Church? So let us commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time together, and we pray that our praise and worship will be a sweet sound in your ear. Amen. And now over to our worship group as their leaders in our opening hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven, great in battle, great in and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Baptist Church but of course we know that the church is bigger than just those of us who gather together here in Grimsby and so today we thought we would look at church across the world. Because our daughter Naomi loves to travel we thought we'd send her across the world to look at churches in different places. So off you go Naomi, get on a plane, head to America, there are churches there. Not only in America, there are churches down under in Australia. There are churches in New Mexico. Churches way over in Japan. Churches in Brazil. And churches in Russia. There are churches all over the world. There are churches that meet in very hot countries, for example, countries in Africa, where perhaps the people dress a little bit differently from how we dress and they use different instruments to worship and praise God. Ooh, that looks hot and sweaty, Naomi. But there are also churches in cold places like Greenland or perhaps Norway or Iceland. Very chilly. Maybe northern Canada. All of those places. There are churches there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Wrap up warm, Naomi. And then there are churches that meet in the deepest, darkest parts of the world, in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, for example. And there are also places that are so difficult to reach. Places where you might have to hike for miles and miles to get to where they are. Places that you might have to canoe down a river or perhaps helicopter across the jungles. And of course at the moment, many of us are having church and gathering together from our couches. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, if you speak different languages, what part of the world you're from, 
If you trust in Jesus Christ as your saviour, you are part of God's church. The only sad thing is there are some places in the world that doesn't have a, don't have a church. Places that have need people to go and take them that message of Jesus Christ to and see a church begin. The wonderful thing is though, there is a promise in Revelation that there will be some from every tribe, nation and tongue. That would be wonderful, won't it? To worship around the throne with somebody from every country in the world.
Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Hello and welcome to the third sermon in our series of What is Church, taken from Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And we are going to look at the breaking of bread, as we know, also known as the communion or the Lord's Supper. And in our time together, we shall also take a brief look at baptism, as these two acts are known as the ordinances. They are our rituals that help us adhere to and show our adherence to our Christian faith. And it's vital that we look at these important acts in biblical context. First, we'll look at the Lord's Supper, and then we'll take a pause to celebrate communion together, and then we'll look at baptism. Our aim during our time together is so that we fully understand why we take this meal and why we take this meal together in this way. It's also that we can be encouraged and consider it more deeply as we partake in that communion meal and to be also to help us to be better equipped as witnesses for Christ through our understanding. And for our non-Christian watchers to debunk many of the myths and mysteries surrounding these things so you get an understanding what is at the heart of our faith. But before we come to God's word let's take some time and ask for God's help and pray together. Father God we so thank you that you are a speaking God and you speak through your word. Father, we would wish this morning that you would speak, you would be heard, and you would speak into our hearts, changing us as your people, conforming us to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we pray that you will glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are going to consider that passage that Vonnie read for us earlier. And it would be really useful if you have your Bibles open at that passage in 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. And to help with the context, we need to first consider our passage in context of the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And from verse 17, he is continuing to write about unity because he writes about unity through all the previous part of the letter. And in chapter 11, he's particularly writing how they should conduct themselves when they corporately gather for worship. And starting in verse 17, Paul is giving the Corinthians a severe admonishment. He's saying, what on earth are you playing at? What are all these divisions amongst you? This is not how you were instructed or how I instructed you. And in fact, he's reminding them of going back to Acts 42, where they should be living and worshipping as a community of God's people in loving fellowship, supporting and caring for each other. And he's saying to them, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, you're all doing your own thing. You've turned it into what it's not supposed to be. Some are starving and others are turning it into wild excess and you're doing it all over, which does not honour either those who have nothing or the ecclesia, this local manifestation of the body of Christ, the church. You're not being a witness to Christ. In fact, Paul is saying to them, you are humiliating. Paul is saying, 
that this should be a simple meal that you should share as one in unity together. That would be fully church. And then Paul comes to explain to us the why starting in verse 23. And as we read there, it is instituted by Jesus, but in this case, directly revealed to Paul. You see it introduces, it's recorded for us in Luke 22, Matthew 26 and Mark 14 there in the Gospels. But Paul didn't get his knowledge from um, the other apostles. He got it directly revealed to him by the Lord Jesus. And we read of that in Galatians 1 from verse 11. And that gives Paul his authority as the 13th apostle. <clears throat> and it validates all he has to say and write to us. So in our passage... Paul is referring back to this Last Supper, the night that Jesus was betrayed, before he went to the cross. And Jesus takes the two elements of this simple meal, the bread and the wine, and in each case he does two things. First of all, he gives thanks. And secondly, he says about each of the elements, do this, eat it or drink it, in remembrance of me. He gives thanks because as we see what these elements represent, we understand that our God is sovereign and all things come from him, our food and the way we live and everything. But in this case, we have to think about and give thanks for the Lord Jesus himself, because he, in this instance, and what he is about to do is a gift from God that we ought to give thanks for. And he says of each of these elements, do this in remembrance of me. So let's first of all look at the bread. Each time we eat, we should remember, of course, the broken physical body of our Lord Jesus as he suffered that ordeal. Not only the rejection, the lashing, the scourging, but the brutal violence of this Roman act of crucifixion. Because I guess in a sense, that's what we would understand you know him being fully man and 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 we as humans would understand that physical pain and all that he went through but he was also fully god and more importantly we should remember jesus greatest suffering on the cross and as eric pointed out to us last week that the wrath of god being heaped upon jesus the wrath of all our sin and all our wrongdoing and all our rebellion, all our disgusting filthiness was laid on him because we are unable to make ourselves right with God. And that in itself being the cause of his wrath and the father turning his face away because our father God, he is holy and he is not able to look upon sin. And this is the thing that Jesus found the most difficult to bear. The breaking of his eternal relationship with his father. That's why he cried out on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbanthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know, don't we, that Jesus and God, they are described as love. And, but this is not an abstract idea. This is real and it is real because uh, something cannot be real unless it's experiential. And Jesus has been in an eternal, perfectly loving relationship with his Father and the Holy Spirit. That's why we can say God is love, because it's an eternal experience before the beginning of time. So the breaking of it, we find it so difficult to imagine it's much beyond our small brains i suppose the nearest we could come to it is when we suffer the loss of a mother or father or child or lose a relative whom we love very much you know and this points us to the great cost of our heavenly father sending his son to be separated from him. Death means separation. And he sent his son to death. And it is good for us to remember. That when we are suffering in those times of 
sickness and injury and persecution and rejection and even in death that Jesus has also experienced all of these things too so he can get alongside with us he can be that genuine comforter because he has total empathy with us and as we eat the bread we remember the cost to Jesus to our father God and to the Holy Spirit and the fact that they went through all this while we were still in rebellion against them and before we even knew them this is the greatest act of love shown in all history just so we could be brought back into a personal relationship with our God forever and then we'll look at the wine every time we drink we are called to remember the lifeblood draining from Jesus and metaphorically washing us clean or covering us so that our holy God does not see our sin but only sees the perfect purity of his son Jesus making it possible for him to look upon us as he is perfectly holy he cannot look upon this sin it's why he turned his face away from Jesus on the cross and this meal the last supper as it's known and the whole act of the crucifixion crucifixion is an echo going back to that story recorded for us in Exodus 12 God's people the Israelites were exiled to Egypt and God brought a series of plagues upon Egypt finishing with the tenth one where he said he would go through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn of both man and beast God instructed his people to take an unblemished lamb, to kill it and smear the blood on the doorpost and lintel. And as he swept through the land, all those households with the smeared blood, he would pass over and the firstborn in those households would be the saved, would be saved. That's why it's known as the Passover meal or Feast of the Passover. And then uh, God instructed his people in verse 14 and he said this, This day for you shall be a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations as a statute forever you shall keep it as a feast. So we as Christian believers are instructed just like Israel in Egypt to keep this as a feast to remember what the Lord has done for us. And then in our passage, Jesus says something really profound. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And covenant means agreement. And he says, this is a new agreement. Because we, as his people, are clearly unable to keep any part of the bargain in keeping of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic law that would make us right before God. Isn't it true the whole story of that Old Testament is of God's people sinning, being brought back, wandering away again. Good kings, bad kings and flawed, sinning heroes. But God had a plan. And Jesus declares this new covenant or new agreement as he is to fulfil both sides of this agreement because we're unable to, we're unable to keep our part. And as the Lord Jesus' blood drains away on the cross, he cries out, Teletestai, it is finished. As he completes this new agreement, and in taking the cup, we should remember this. We should remember that as he makes this all possible to believe in him, and able to turn from our sin to repent, and we will be saved for eternity as his children and be a witness to the world through it. Some believe that the bread and wine turn into the actual body and blood of Christ or somehow hide themselves inside the elements. But to me, scripture is really clear. It's using a metaphor, helping us understand the deep significance of the body and blood of Christ as he went to the cross. 
Before verse 36, we are called to look back and remember. But from verse 26, we are called to look forward and remember the promise of the second coming of Jesus and the culmination of his finished work. When he calls his people, those who have responded and been saved, to live with him in a new heaven and earth and not be consigned to an eternity in hell. A terrible place described fully in the Bible. And when we drink, we are, we are proclaiming we are on the side of Jesus, the glorious victor who is coming back to throw Satan and his victims into an eternal hell and recreate new heavens and earth. And then in verse 27, there is this warning of partaking of this meal in an unworthy manner. And just to cover this point briefly, uh, the unworthy manner can be split into two. Firstly, um, if you are taking part and you are not a believer, this meal is actually for those who identify with Christ and are in unity with him. So if you have joined us now, but you cannot say that you are a Christian, please take part by just observing what we do. And secondly, this is a sign of unity with Christ but also with each other, as the church is known as the body of Christ. So we're all called to be in unity with each other, and it calls us to put right any dispute we have with each other before we sit down and share the meal together. It's calling us into unity and emphasises the corporate nature of this shared meal. Let me now hand you over to Eric and Kim, who are going to lead us in our act of remembrance in communion. We now come to the part of the service where we will take the elements in remembrance of the sacrifice of what our Lord and Saviour Jesus did. That on that cross of Calvary, the eternal plan of God was completed. And a promise made in Exodus that he would redeem his people with an outstretched arm came to fulfilment. And as we approach the table, we should have mixed feelings. We should come deeply sorrowful and repentant for our sins and the harm that we cause Christ and we cause the body and we cause each other. These should weigh as burdens upon us. But if we only come to the table sorrowful and mournful, we miss the beauty of the table. It would be like living always in Good Friday and never having Easter Sunday. So as we come, we also remember what God's eternal work was completed on that day. And we should have joy and celebrations in our heart because our sins that we bring to him they are forgiven that we who believe are in right fellowship with God and as we look back at the bread we look at Corinthians and Paul writes that on the night before he was betrayed he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Father God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for your redemptive plan. And we know that we are fallen and broken individuals. Lord, we are sorry for the sins that we commit. We are sorry for the harm that we do to your body and the harm that we do to each other. Father, we approach you burdened by our sins. They weigh heavy on us. And we know that it was because of us. The only way that we have a chance of being back with you was through a perfect sacrifice and your son became that became the curse so that we could be saved from the curse 
Lord, we thank you. Amen. This is my body, broken for you. The body of Christ. In the same way we read that he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes And I think that's what we need to remember, that we are proclaiming his death until he comes. And we see in Revelation that the joy is the lamb approaches the throne. And just as we mourn our sins, we are joyous in his resurrection and the gift that he has given to us. So we also... Take part in the blood of Christ. Lord, we are so very thankful and we give you all the glory and honour and praise that your redemptive plan was brought to completion at Calvary. That, Lord, you chose us to be in the body with you. Lord, we thank you that our sins are forgiven and that we can have the assurance through you through your son and through the holy spirit that on that day we will rise and we will be with you for eternity the blood of christ spilled for you
Reading from Matthew chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptised by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptised, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We are now going to take a few moments uh, to look at the second of the ordinances, baptism, and the passage that shows us Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17, also kindly read for us there by Vonnie. There are some questions that arise here, I guess. You know, why do we practice full immersion baptism? Why be baptised? But firstly, I'm going to answer the question of what baptism is not. Baptism is not equivalent to salvation. Being baptised does not make you a Christian in and of itself. You become a Christian by being born again or saved, just as Jesus answered Nicodemus in John's Gospel in chapter 3, verse 3, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So one would be a Christian before baptism. So why be baptised? Well firstly there are several answers to that question but firstly because Jesus was baptised. In our passage we see Jesus being baptised by John the Baptist and Jesus was being obedient to his father and that pleased him because he says so in verse 17. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So it also pleases God when we are baptised too. And further on in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus also commands it in chapter 29, verse 19, where he says, quite famously, quite well known, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And all three of these persons, these persons of the Trinity, we see in our passage, Jesus being baptised, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and the Father being well pleased. And as in Matthew 28, 19, we do it in obedience to Jesus. In Acts 2, from which we've taken our framework for this series of preaching of what is church, he says in verse 41, the verse before we started in, two, for, in Acts 2, 42, which comes at the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So those who received his word were baptised, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So being baptised, we are being added to God's people. And in the context of Acts 2, we are in effect being welcomed into the Church of Christ. And therefore, we are being welcomed into that local manifestation of the Church of Christ when we are baptised here at Grimsby Baptist Church. I think we should also notice that in Matthew 3 that John the, Baptist, John the Baptist was baptizing many people so there would have been a crowd there and you can see this borne out in the other, doc, uh, in the other Gospels particularly in Luke 3. So this act of baptism is done as a public witness. It shows our obedience as we have looked at it, but it also shows that we have confessed our sin like those baptised earlier in, in, by John in verse 6, where it says, and they were baptised in the Jordan, confessing their sins. In the book of Romans, in chapter 6, which is about death to sin and alive to God, we read these words in verse 4 speaking of our union with Christ. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we might too walk in the newness of life. So when we conduct a baptism, we do it publicly and we lower the candidate into the water, which symbolizes death to the old sinful self. The water then is washing us clean, but really from inside, not the outside, from our sin. And then as the believer rises out of the water to new life with Christ for the glory of God. Because as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So as we do that, we are making a public declaration of our personal statement of our faith about the Lord Jesus, as laid out in these facts from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 6. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. We are declaring our belief in the truth of the gospel of the good news of the saving work of the Lord Jesus we also at baptism we will give our testimony actually it's the Lord's testimony in what he has done in our lives to save us it is the story of our conversion why do we give it because it is a witness and, uh, and an encouragement to all who hear it. And you know, it's the one thing that no one can take away from us because it's real. Because it's what actually happened to us. So we look forward to that day when we can meet together as a Church of Christ in Laceby Road, share that communion meal together and remember what Christ has done for us and gather and welcome new believers into the church and celebrate his glory. That's church. So we've looked at the two ordinances of communion and baptism and I pray that you've both been enlightened and encouraged by God as we have looked at those together. But if you're one of those people out there that has raised further questions, then I or any of the leadership team here would be happy to engage with you about them. If so, please contact us through our website. Let's pray. Father God, we so thank you for what you have done for us. Father, would you help us? Would you help us declare the good news of the gospel? Would you help us be those witnesses to you? Help us remember what you've done through us through, through this act and sharing of a meal of communion. And help us when we come to baptism, as we, uh, as we see new people enter the kingdom of God and the church of Christ. What great celebrations we will have when that can happen. Father, and as we think about coming together soon, we pray as a church to do these things. We are in your hands and we will do everything for your glory as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to I would refuse you still 
But as I ran, my hell bound race, it different to the cost you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place, and bore the wrath reserved for me, now all I know is grace. So all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only boast. As our time together comes to a close, if you have any questions about what you have heard today, about Grimsby Baptist Church or the Christian faith, then please do not hesitate to make contact with us through our website, www.grimsbybaptistchurch.co.uk. May I remind you that we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 7.45 via Zoom, and I hope that you'll be able to join us then. And a closing prayer. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen. Amen.